Welcome to our next lecture on uh, realism and social issues. This is going to be a two-part video uh, because I don't want the video to run too long. It takes a long time to upload them when you had a long one. Um, so this first one is going to cover Chopin's The Storm. Um, and uh, then the, um, the next one is going to cover Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Yellow Wallpaper. You want to pay very close attention because I'm going to do something tricky with the quizzes and uh, the quiz questions, all right? So let's talk a little bit about Chopin, uh, her background and her work. We don't have to go into big biography about it, but what you see with Kate Chopin and some others like Sarah Orne Jewett and other people like that um, is uh, this rise after the Civil War of what we call regional literature. In other words, right after the Civil War, remember we talked about the fact that, that people traveled all over the country and people began to see different parts of the country and different peoples and populations uh, were exposed to different geography and regions. And so it became a very interesting thing for readers to read about people in very different parts of the country. So if you lived in New England and you wanted to know about the Wild West or down south or sort of the Midwest or something like that, you could turn to some of your favorite authors because these authors were now traveling more, getting out and seeing this big wide open country and noting all of the different sort of cultural differences, even language differences. Well, Kate Chopin falls right very conveniently in that pocket. That's not the only reason to read Kate Chopin, but it is an interesting region, reason because Chopin was originally from St. Louis, Midwest, and she married a man um, named Chopin and moved to southern Louisiana, Cajun country, right? And uh, if there's one thing that you know, if you've ever been to Louisiana, that's a very different part of the, of the United States. The language is different, the food is different, the culture is different, the history is different, and it's really, really, very interesting. Um, and so imagine over 100 years ago, People who had never left, you know, their uh, their hometown in, uh, you know, in Ohio or in Boston or in New York saying to themselves, well, I want to read more about this place. It seems like a very, you know, mysterious and exotic land. She was very taken by it and was very interested in the people who lived there and trying to learn and appreciate um, their lifestyle and their culture and their traditions. Um, it's a very interesting multicultural kind of place. If you've been to Southern Louisiana, you have the influence of, of course, white settlers. You have the influence of former enslaved people, uh, Native American people, and uh, also French speaking Cajuns. Now, where, where you get the word Cajun from Acadian. It's a sort of shorthand of Acadian. Where was Acadia? Up in Canada. In other words, the French people who call themselves Cajun today are descended from French Canadians from Acadia, who, after the British defeated the French, relocated many of them from that province down to Louisiana, and they brought with them that French language, but with a twist, right? It's a kind of a fun language uh, to, to, uh, to listen to if you, if you, if you are interested in, in that sort of thing. It brought some of their dietary things and, uh, you know, traditions and things of this nature, music and everything makes for a wonderful uh, thing. And they, many of them intermarried with some of the people who were formerly enslaved or indigenous people there or other people from other different cultures. And that multicultural, intercultural group of people is known as Creoles. So Cajun is that traditional um, French culture that was transplanted, Creole is the kind of mixed culture. So when you re eat Cajun food, you're eating Cajun food. When you're eating Creole food, you're eating something different than Cajun food. So now you know, right? So um, let's take a look at this particular story, which is frankly a piece of a much larger set of stories. So we're kind of reading just one, one snippet out of it. All of these characters had backgrounds prior to this. We won't go into it all. You can take a look at that if you liked it on your own. But you know early on that um, Calixta and uh, her family, Bibi and Bobino, uh, are, um, are a family, a family unit. Um, uh, and the, um, they, they live in, uh, in a particular uh, Acadian household out in the countryside. And uh, there's a storm a coming. Right, storm is brewing, and uh, BB and Bobby No decide they're going to go off and go get something from uh, the local grocer, uh, and then bring it back. And uh, I'm going to do a fairly close reading here because the language is imp as important, I think, as the storyline itself. Because Chopin is writing something here that, when you get to the end of it, it it 
It could be a little bit shocking even today, but imagine how shocking it was back in 1898, because it is dealing with infidelity. It's dealing with sexuality, okay? Again, issues that a Victorian from a previous generation, a romantic, probably wouldn't have raised very much. If they did, they would have raised these kinds of things in a highly moralistic manner, right? Like, you shouldn't do this, and oh, this is bad, and oh. And they would use language, uh, a romantic, that would kind of skirt around it. They wouldn't be as, I don't know, direct or blunt in, in their language. They wouldn't they would dodge the issue a little bit, right? They'd be a little bit, they'd deal with it with kid gloves, as they say. But not a realist. A realist says, mm -mm, we're going to explore this. We're going to take a look at it the way it really is, the way people really behave. And we're going to let the chips fall where they may. I'm not going to stick an automatic moral on the end. So they decide to go off to Friedheimer's store and uh, leaving Calixta behind. And so she's out on the front porch and she's hanging up laundry. And along comes... I'll say la baye, right? Uh, and I'll say is someone that she has known before. And we, if you can piece it together, you can figure out what that is. Um, as she stepped out, I'll say la baye rode in, on, in at the gate. She had not seen him very often since her marriage and never alone. Ah, so you need to, you got to read carefully, right? She'd never, she hadn't seen him since her marriage uh, very often. And never alone. Well, wonder why that is, right? She stood there with Bobino's coat in her hands, and the big raindrops began to fall. Now, whose coat, right? I said vest on the slide there. It's really his coat. Um, in her hands. So, in other words, physically between her and Alsay is the empty coat being held in front of her, of her husband. He's not there, right? Look at all the wonderful symbolism in the house. The storm is coming, and of course, the storm and their sexual passion and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you got to be stupid not to see that. That or you just, I don't know. Um, maybe you were maybe you were reading half asleep, okay? May I come in and wait on your gallery till the storm's over, Calixta? Come on come on in, uh, Monsieur Elsay. His voice and her own startled her as if from a trance. She seized Bobby No's vest. There's the vest. I wasn't wrong. Um, she seized his vest. So she's grabbing like empty scraps of her husband, almost in a sense, trying to like, uh, uh, I don't trust myself with this man. Where's my husband? Where's my husband? Um, a little bit later down, she, uh, the, uh, the narrator says, she was a little fuller of figure than five years before when she married, but she had lost nothing of her vivacity. Her blue eyes still retained their melting quality, and her yellow hair, disheveled by the wind and rain, kinked more stubbornly than ever about her ears and temple. At temples, the rain beat upon the low shingled roof with a force and clatter that threatened to break an entrance and deluge them there. Right? Ah, uh, the rain is picking up. The more, the more those old feel, and they, they knew each other, didn't they? Mm-hmm. They knew each other. He knew her at least five years before. Now she's had a child, and she's a little bit fuller figure, but she's still a looker boy, and he has not forgotten. Uh, if this keeps up, do say if the levee's going to stand it, right? If this keeps up, God knows if the levee is going to break, right? Oh, there's a levee going to break, all right. It's called your passion. Control yourselves. But they don't, do they, right? So this is a naughty story. I'm sorry, but it's true. It's a naughty story. Um, and I know you thoroughly enjoyed it, too. The uh, Alsay gets up to join her at the window. And, of course, they're looking out at the storm. And, of course, a big thunderclap makes her jump into his arms. She didn't mean to, of course. It's just, that's, you know, boom, and she gets frightened, and he grasps, grasps her. Calixta put her hands to her eyes in a cry, staggered backwards, of course, and her his arms... His arms encircle her, like I said, and uh, uh, sorry about the glitch there. Um, she wonders about BB, and then all of a sudden she would not compose herself. She would not be seated. Alsay clasped her shoulders and looked into her face. The contact of her warm, palpitating body when he had unthinkingly drawn her into his arms had aroused all the old-time infatuation and desire for the flesh. Uh, for her flesh. This is some racy stuff, isn't it? This is, think guys, this is 122 years ago. This is a long time ago. Can you imagine what readers thought of this? First of all, I'm sure that if they read it, they probably hid it in a, you know, in, in, a, in a cupboard someplace in a brown paper bag unmarked uh, and drew it out only when they wanted, you know, when they knew the coast was clear to read it. He pushed her hair back from her face that was warm and steaming. Her lips were as red and moist as pomegranate seed. Her white neck and a glimpse of her full 
full, firm bosom disturbed him powerfully. As she glanced up at him, the fear in her liquid blue eyes had given place to a drowsy gleam that unconsciously betrayed a sensuous desire. He looked down into her eyes, and there was nothing for him to do but to gather her lips in a kiss. It reminded her him of assumption. I mean, guys... I don't know about y'all, but I'm getting a little warm in here. Um, it's uh, my word. This is <laughs> palpitating things and 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 bosoms, bosoms and stuff. I mean, when this is, I mean, they're, they're talking about breasts and things, right? Um, and, you know, stuff like you know, getting steamy and all this. This is really racy stuff. Now, he says that all of this reminded him of assumption. Now. What is assumption? If you don't have the context, assumption is a parish, and in Louisiana they have parishes rather than counties. You know, we have Denton County and Dallas County and Tarrant County. They have parishes, assumption parish. So he is recalling back to the day when they evidently had been seeing each other prior to her marriage, mind you. And he says, do you remember in assumption, Calixta? Uh, oh, she remembered. For in assumption, he had kissed her and kissed her and kissed her until his senses would well nigh fail. And watch the language here. And to save her, he would resort to a desperate flight. If she was not an immaculate dove in those days, she was still inviolate. A passionate creature whose very defenselessness had made her defense, against which his honor forbade him to prevail. Now, let's decode that and untangle that, right? He rode away to save her. He left to save her. She was still inviolate, right? Had not been violated, um, meaning she was still pure in the sexual sense. A passionate creature. So, so but, but notice this. If she was not an immaculate dove, she was inviolate. What does that mean? Well, she was still a virgin, but it didn't mean she hadn't done a few things, okay? But they went so far. In other words, they had had a relationship before she was married, and they had gone eh, pretty far around the bases, but not all the way home, if you know what I mean, okay? And I'm sorry if this is embarrassing, but that is what she's trying to do here, Chopin. She's trying to get real, real people, not some made-up fantasy fairy tale, that people do this kind of stuff, right? And more, um, even in those days they did. So grandma, grandma, you know, she had her dalliances too. Now, why does he leave? He leaves to save her. Why does he, what does that mean? That she, that he could have, but his honor prevailed upon him to say no. In other words, she was betrothed to her current husband. She was engaged, but she loved Alsay. She loved her husband, yes, but in a different kind of way. You know, there was, you know, her husband, but then there's I'll say, right? Okay, so, I mean, she kind of loves her husband, but she really, really has a thing for I'll say. He knows that if he wants to take it farther, she would. And he says, I can't do that to her because I can't, I can't get her in trouble. Right. And so I'm going to have to do the honorable thing and ride away. Um, so against his against which his will for his honor forbade him to prevail. Now, well, now her lips seemed in a manner free to be tasted, as well as her round white throat and her whiter breast. There's in breasts again. They did not heed the crap. Well, what, what's different now? She's married. Isn't that awful? Isn't that terrible? Isn't that that's adultery? Yeah, but if something happens, being a married woman, uh, maybe ain't nobody going to know, right? He seems like, well, now, wait a minute. Now that she's married, uh, what would the consequences be? Well, she might get pregnant, but hey, she could always claim it's it. You see what's going on here? That is really something to be talking about in 1898 and to be talking about it in that way. And notice that the narrator is not commenting on that. She's just relaying how the characters feel. She's not saying, oh, and this was a terrible thing. You shouldn't have done it. Oh, it's awful, awful, man. Um, they did not heed the crashing torrents and the roar of the elements made her laugh as she lay in his arms. She was a revelation of that dim, mysterious chamber. As white as the couch she lay upon, her firm, elastic flesh that was knowing for the first time its birthright. 
was like a creamy lily that the sun invites to contribute its breath and perfume to the undying life of the world. Let's go back, take a look at the language one more time. Her firm elastic flesh that was knowing for the first time its birthright. What is a birthright? Well, it's kind of like an inheritance. It's kind of like something you're entitled to from birth, right? If you remember the Old Testament story of Jacob and Esau, right? Jacob tricks Esau into giving him his birthright, which is his inheritance. What is this birthright that she's talking about here? Chopin, what is she talking about? That her flesh was knowing for the first time its birthright. Her flesh has a birthright. Her body has a birthright, something she is entitled to. What is that? It is physical pleasure. That's what it is. And so when we talk about the, 18, the 1800s, we talk about a period before then, people's attitudes towards sex were quite different, even among married couples. Now, many married couples had very fulfilled and very satisfying relationships emotionally and sexually. So we can't say, well, they were all miserable. No, no, that's not true. We know that's not the case. But there were a lot of people who did get married out of a sense of duty or responsibility, or they simply wanted to have a family or security. And they might have married somebody that they thought, well, this person, I'm compatible with this person. This person is a nice person and treats me well and provides well for my and 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 for 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 me and my children and is somebody that you're fond of right that seems to be the relationship that calixta has with her husband she is fond of him she does love him in a certain sense but there are lots of different types of love one gathers obviously that they've had a sexual relationship they wouldn't have a, a, a little boy if they hadn't but is not exactly what you would necessarily want in that kind of relationship. At least that's what the narrator seems to indicate to us, that that even though this seems almost voyeuristic, sex between her and her husband is okay, maybe, I guess, but it ain't like it is with Al Say, because here she is for the knowing for the first time its birthright. What is that birthright? The birthright is sexual pleasure. And what Chopin is saying here that is so radical and revolutionary is Women deserve to have a satisfying physical, sexual relationship. They deserve that. And it's something you're entitled to. It's not something you should apologize for or be embarrassed about or, or anything like that. That's incredibly progressive for 1898, isn't it? Very progressive. Does it help if I tell you that Chopin didn't really have a great marriage with her husband and actually left him? Yeah, um, something wasn't working there. Um, and so she's kind of making the case here and pounding the table and saying women have rights in this respect with respect to this particular issue as well. Why is it that only men are considered, um, it's only considered appropriate for men to say, to be sexually satisfied. Why aren't women, um, entitled to that? They're entitled. She says she's entitled. When he touched her breast, they gave themselves up in quivering, ex I mean, in quivering ecstasy, inviting his lips. Oh my gosh, there's like quivering stuff going on here. Um, their mouth was a fountain of delight, etc. He stays cushioned upon her, breathless, dazed, enervated with his heart beating like a hammer upon her. And they almost fall asleep in the rain. It's a good thing they didn't. <laughs> Because there would have been shotguns involved, I'm guessing. Um, and the rain was over and the sun was turning the glistening green world into a palace of gems. Calixta on the gallery watched Al say, right away. He turned and smiled at her with a beaming face and she lifted her pretty chin in the air and laughed aloud. What? What? Now wait, I'm sure by the end of this story, there'll be some guilt and some remorse and terrible, terrible punishment and consequences for this. Right? wrong. Is the sex part as, as disturbing to her readers as the lack of consequences? No. The thing that made this story so objectionable to so many people wasn't necessarily the sexuality and the adultery. That would have been really unnerving to readers and critics. But what really disturbed people was the idea that a married middle-class woman would have an affair like this that was purely sexual and that there were no consequences to it. Because we see at the end of the story, oh my gosh, they come home 
and she hugs her husband and little boy and how oh, how was th- how were things oh we got the shrimp right everything's all really good and everything um and uh he, he you know everything was good and um everybody's laughing and joking and they had a lovely dinner and th- the end of her story wait no no remorse no suicide no oh my gosh i'm such a horrible person and oh i'm i'm, I'm an adulterer ah, no nothing like that well, surely I'll say felt terrible about having sex with a married woman. No, he didn't. In fact, I'll say wrote to his wife Clarice that night. It was a loving letter full of tender solicitude. He told her not to hurry back, but if she and the babies liked it in Biloxi, to stay a month longer. Yeah, I'll bet. Stay a month longer if you want to. He was getting along nicely. Yes, he was. Uh, and though he missed them, he was willing to bear the separation a while longer realizing that her health and pleasure were the first things to be considered. Oh, how big of him, right? Okay, he's okay. His wife, however, Clarice, as she she was charmed upon receiving her husband's letter, she and the babies were doing well, the society was agreeable, many of their old friends and acquaintances were at the bay. At the first free breath since her marriage... See, uh, and the first free breath since her marriage seemed to restore the pleasant liberty of her maiden days. Right? She was happy to say, you know, it's kind of nice. It's like being single again. I had a lot of fun. So I'm hanging out with the girls and the babies are here and uh, we're having a good time at the beach and eh, I'm not in a hurry to go home. I kind of like it. I kind of like hanging out with uh, having girls time. Um, Devoted as she was to her husband, their intimate conjugal life was something which she was more than willing to forego for a while. Right? She loved her husband, but not really all that interested in sex right now, maybe later. So for the time being, I'm good being celibate, (laughs) right? Um, So the storm passed and everyone was happy. Whoa, there is no moral at the end here. No regret. Like I said, realists say, look, sometimes people do things like this and everything blows up and it's terrible. Sometimes they do things like this, and no one knows, and if nobody knows, nobody gets hurt. Chopin seems to be advocating, for heaven's sakes, open relationships, which for the time was just stunning. Uh, She certainly um, is showing us that not all things that might be seen as transgressions and whatnot end up being punished. Uh, sometimes people rob banks and get away with it. (laughs) Sometimes people commit adultery and nobody is harmed by it. Um, I happen to not think adultery is a good thing. Um, I happen to think that sooner or later you do receive consequences as a result of that. So on a personal level, you or I or anybody else might say, yeah, okay. But Chopin's trying to make a point here. And the point is, look, not all relationships are the same. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe there's another way to end a story like this rather than the tired old romantic Victorian finger wagon. You shouldn't do this kind of stuff. Uh, sort of moral at the end. Now, I told you that the quiz was going to be a little bit different. Um, And so uh, I will tell you in the middle of the the next video uh, what our two quiz questions are, right? So uh, click on over to the second video, if you would, and uh, it's going to be about Charlotte Perkins Gilman.